Hello again. Um, this video, I just want to go over the topic of Jews and Bolshevism and kind of just address uh, head on some of this stuff regarding Jewish uh, supposed overrepresentation in the Bolshevik party. Um, and I just want to give like straight up stats and figures and like kind of no nonsense stuff from scholarly books and works. Uh, I just kind of want to stick to bare facts and whatnot. So I'm going to get into that. I'm also going to give just like a little bit of context of Russia a little bit before the revolution, uh, the situation of Jews there, and then just go over the Bolshevik coup and the civil war and kind of how all that played out. So yeah, that's what I'll be doing in this video. Okay, so first off, the Jews of the Russian Empire were basically all living in what is known as the Pale of Settlement. That's the western border of the Russian Empire. Um, that includes like modern day Belarus, Lithuania, Moldova, uh, parts of Ukraine and Poland. And basically the Jews living there were restricted in a lot of uh, economic activities and just kind of basically didn't really assimilate. They were mainly religious, uh, Orthodox Jews. They didn't really you know, want to assimilate, and there wasn't really much of a path for them to assimilate anyway, if they did want to, um, and they couldn't go to any other, more or less, like, I mean, there's always exceptions, but they couldn't really go to other parts of the empire where a lot more, you know, the big economic centers of, like, Moscow and St. Petersburg were, so they basically just lived their lives in the pale, and um, starting in the, it was kind of, the situation was always back and forth, like, there was sometimes more, like, liberal ideas regards to the Jews and like more freedom for them and then other times it was more restricted and then in the late 1880s with the assassination of the Tsar or not the late 1880s I think I guess the beginning of the 1880s the assassination of the Tsar um, there was the passage of the May laws which just put more restrictions on the Jews in the pale so that was basically the situation of Jewry in the Russian Empire until the abolition of the pale with the February revolution of 1917 um, which formally abolished the Pale with the provisional government um, led by uh, Alexander Kerensky. In terms of population, um, I want to look at two senses, senses, I don't know how to say that in the plural, of the uh, Russian Empire. So the first census I want to look at is the census of 1897, um, and it shows that the Jewish population was about 5 million, so roughly 4% of the Russian population at the time. And like I said, mostly in the Pale of Settlement. And then going after the revolution, the next available census is after the revolution, after the Civil War is over. That's in 1926. And the Jewish population is more or less 3 million. So I'm not sure what the percentage of that is of the new Russian, well, the Soviet Union. Because after the Civil War, after World War I, there's parts of the old Russian Empire that were lost. Um, so, yeah, and then obviously there was loss of life and emigration. Uh, many uh, Russian Jews went to the United States, uh, Germany, other places. So, but I mean, just in that context, there was like millions of Jews uh, in the Russian Empire, Soviet Union, and roughly like two to four percent of the population. And then just to add on top of all that, there were um, numerous pogroms, so basically like bands of vigilantes, I guess you'd say, um, who would go and like kill and murder a bunch of Jews in like various parts of the Pale. Um, again, that kind of started with, I mean, it always occurred a little bit, but it kind of ramped up in the late 1800s with the assassination of the Tsar. Um, and that also led to a lot of emigration away from Russia to the U.S. So... That's also just something to bear in mind. And then the pogroms come back, like, really in full force during the Russian Civil War. So then looking at the revolutionary parties in the Russian Empire, um, obviously the Bolsheviks were not the only revolutionaries in the empire. Um, even, you know, 100 years prior, in the 1820s, the Decemberists were a group who wanted to overthrow the Tsar. In the 1870s and 60s, there were Russian populist groups uh, called the Narodniks who wanted to overthrow the Tsar. Um, and they all had their each uh, individual tendencies. Um, they weren't all communists, but I guess you could say they were all socialists or social democrats, however you want to put it. Um, 
And then the Russian Communist Party itself had multiple branches, most notably the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. I'm sure you guys have all heard this in whatever sixth grade history class. Um, but I do want to look at the Mensheviks versus Bolsheviks. Um, I think that's a pretty good example of Jews being overrepresented in the Menshevik faction um, and maybe a bit overrepresented in the Bolsheviks, but it seems to me that the Bolshevik faction was definitely more of a greater Russian party. Um, and there's even a quote from Stalin, or maybe Stalin quoting someone else, saying uh, during one of the party congresses that the the party, the Communist Party of Russia, needs to have a pogrom within the party, uh, essentially pointing out that the Mensheviks were kind of the Jewish faction and the Bolsheviks were the Russian faction in his eyes. For example, uh, at the Fifth Party Congress of the Russian Communist Party in 1907, we can see that of the Bolsheviks, 78.1% uh, were Russians, ethnic Russians, so that's 82 members, and then Jews being 12 members, so that's 11.4%, with Georgians as well, and others. And then in the Mensheviks, it's not exactly turned around, but there's a far greater proportion of Jews, far lesser proportion of Russians. And what I find interesting is a even higher percentage of Georgians for whatever reason. And Georgians, I find that surprising because Georgians like really aren't even that big of a population in general, much smaller than the Jewish population. Um, and uh, I think that could probably be explained by just communist political groups in general do appeal to minorities in a lot of ways. And that's kind of a reoccurring theme in the uh, Bolshevik party that there's a lot of Latvians, Polish people, Georgians, Jews, of course, Armenians. Um, not saying that Russians weren't the majority, but they were never like at the vast, like 99%. Um, and that wasn't even the case in the Russian empire. Like, of course, there's other uh, minorities in the Russian empire. So it kind of just made sense that minorities would be involved. And just a little add-on to the Fifth Congress in 1907, um, in terms of, like, Jews at the Congress, there was also the Bund, the Jewish Bund, which was basically, like, the Jewish National Socialist Party. Um, so there were uh, delegates from the Bund itself. So apart from the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, there was the Jewish Bund. And so, obviously, everyone, all the delegates of the Bund were obviously Jewish, because it's the Jewish Socialist Party, uh, National Party. But also at the Congress... There were the uh, Polish Social Democratic Party and the Latvian Social Democratic Party. So um, just because back in those days, I guess kind of like now, but even more so, uh, different ethnic groups had their own parties. It just made sense linguistically, culturally, uh, geographically that uh, certain groups would be represented, you know, based on their group identity, so to speak. But they were all kind of unified in that they wanted social democracy uh, and then what that meant obviously differed. Uh, some were more Marxist, some were less so. Um, but, yeah. Okay, so skipping ahead a little bit, World War I happens, and then in 1917, the Tsar abdicates, and the provisional government takes over, led by Alexander Kerensky. And so this government abolishes the Pale of Settlement, which basically gives Jews equal rights, uh, regardless of their ethnicity, religion, whatever. So Jews more or less like the provisional government. They, for obvious reasons, didn't really like the Tsar too much, um, but they have no issues with Kerensky, uh, who a lot of people said was a Jew, who really isn't, but I'll talk about that later. Um, and they, so they're fine with the provisional government. Um, and you can actually see their voting patterns in the, for the constituent assembly elections. They mainly vote for Jewish national parties. Um, and a little bit of like Jewish socialist parties, but practically none of them vote for the Bolshevik party. And the Bolsheviks mainly get their support from Russian workers in the major cities, industrial workers. Um, but it really doesn't even matter anyway, the constituent assembly elections, because the Bolsheviks just take power and do a coup. Um, and then we can look at that as well to see the Jewish role in the coup and the Bolshevik revolution, the civil war, etc. In terms of the Bolshevik Party rank-and-file membership, um, it seems pretty consistent that 5% of the rank-and-file were Jewish members. Um, that's pretty consistent from 1917 throughout the 20s and 30s. Um, so that is technically an overrepresentation based on the population, like ranging from like 2 to 4% of the empire, which turned into the Soviet Union. 
So that's like a small overrepresentation. Um, they were not the only group that had overrepresentation in the party. Like I said previously, communist movements a lot of the time appeal to minority groups because um, they're usually oppressed somewhat or just want to better themselves and aren't necessarily loyal to the status quo, government, ruling body, whatever. So anyway, they're, they were 5%. Um, and you could see like statistics um, in the early party censuses. So there's that information. Um, but that 5% doesn't necessarily mean that like throughout the whole party, like the upper echelons of the party, it was just 5%. Um, I would, I think it's pretty clear that in the higher uh, positions of the party, it was a greater percentage. Um, again, not like a huge like majority, but just like a disproportionate minority, um, which eventually, you know, dissipated anyway. But so that, that base 5% number is good to know. But before I go into the numbers regarding the Central Committee and Politburo, I want to look at the coup itself and the following civil war. So interestingly enough, the only two members of the Central Committee who have voted against the October coup led by Lenin were uh, Zinoviev and Kamenev, and they're like two of the famous Jewish members um, who later on get kicked out of the party along with Trotsky, but that's not, neither here nor there. Um, so those are the only two people who voted against the coup and almost got kicked out of the party then and there. Um, but ultimately didn't at the time. So just, there's that little tidbit. Um, but after the coup occurs, uh, many Mensheviks uh, were totally against it, like Martov and others. Um, most of the Jewish socialist parties at the time were against the coup, because like I said, that they were pretty fond of the provisional government. Uh, the Bund, etc. were not fond of the coup. They thought it unnecessary. Um, and then later on, when the Civil War actually breaks out, um, some of the first pogroms against Jews, I think actually the very first ones were um, done by the Red Army. And this is kind of odd because Leon Trotsky, like famously Jewish, uh, is the leader of the Red Army. But again, it's not like every Red Army soldier is this devout uh, believer in Marxism and like, they're very idealistic. I mean, they're just, you know, people who are conscripted to fight. So in the Russian mindset of the time, I mean, Jews were not <laughs> seen very favorably. So regardless of the factions, there was multiple factions in the Civil War, but like all of them basically um, engaged in pogroms. But it seems that the white army, the opposing faction to the Bolsheviks committed more. And there's statistics to bear that out. And then also the main difference being that the Bolsheviks, when they committed pogroms, they were usually punished. Uh, Lenin and Trotsky, of course, they didn't really like pogroms against Jews just for being Jews. Um, they would punish the perpetrators of those crimes. And that kind of goes back to Lenin, his idea that the Jews aren't really a nation of their own. There was the whole national question. Uh, Stalin wrote on this. And uh, it it's all comes from Lenin, essentially, though, that the Jews don't really count as a, na a nation of themselves because they don't have a... At the time, they didn't have a land. They didn't have a unified language and um, all that. So, But he didn't think of them as, like, bad, necessarily. He just thought, kind of like Marx himself, he just thought that they would eventually, once communism comes to be, like, they would just be there would be no Jewish question left. They would just be absorbed into the proletariat. Um, but anyway, so all that to say that there was Jewish opposition to the Bolsheviks during the coup and after during the Civil War. Um, there's examples of Jews helping the white army um, and providing funds for them. Uh, famously, Ilya Ehrenberg, who later on became a... Uh, propagandizer for the Soviet Union, especially during World War II. He wrote a lot of anti-Nazi propaganda. He was initially a supporter of the White Army. Um, it was just not until 1919 that the White Army pogroms kind of overtook the Bolshevik ones, and the White Army just, because they were mainly people who had previously been in the Tsarist Army, 
which the Tsarist army was pretty notorious for being anti-Jewish. There was just like a lot of anti-Jewish sentiment and the fact that Trotsky was the leader of the Bolsheviks. A lot of them just basically thought that, oh, the Bolsheviks are Jews and we hate Jews, so it's all fair game. Um, eventually, that got to the point where Jewish, Jewish people had to essentially take a side of either death or the Bolsheviks. I mean, that's at least what it seemed to them at the time. There's some people who disagree with that. Like, I know Schultz and Nietzsche in 200 Years Together, he talks about, that, like, oh, the Jews joined before pogroms even happened. But I don't really see that borne out in what I've read. Um, but, yeah, so in 1919, even the Bund uh, officially joins the Bolsheviks. And um, so, but that's like a solid two years after the Civil War starts. So um, it doesn't seem that the Jews were all like totally in favor of the Bolsheviks. Like, oh, like 100%. I mean, it seemed like essentially it was just a minority until eventually I would say that they were more or less forced into joining one side or the other. And one side wanted to eradicate them and one side didn't. So in my mind, that makes the most sense of that information. Also, real quick, I thought I would share some tidbits I found while researching the topic regarding, like, who's a Jew and who's not a Jew. I see the same thing on, like, dumb sites like 4chan and stuff. People will just, like, claim someone's a Jew because they don't like him. The same thing seemed to be going on during this time. Um, for example, during the coup, there was graffiti in Russian cities that said, down with the Jew Kerensky and up with Trotsky. And it was, like, obviously pro-Bolshevik graffiti. But that's clearly a reversal of the actual, like, facts. Like, obviously, Trotsky's a Jew. And Alexander Kerensky, people, some people say he was, but I found no evidence for that, and I think it's totally false. Um, also, there was a soldier quoted as saying, oh, Lenin, we don't really trust him. Like, he's the Jew, but Trotsky, we trust him. He's, like, a Russian. He's one of us. Um, but that's, again, like, a total reversal. Unless you count, like, the whole, like, oh, Lenin had, like, one Jewish grandfather, but... I don't count that, really. And then um, also the Bolshevik troops, some of them had slogans such as down with the Yids and up with the Soviets. So clearly the whole meme of like, oh, the Bolsheviks were just like patsies for the Jews and like just total puppets. Like, I think that's a totally, total simplification. I think you can argue that they were more lenient towards Jews. Like they didn't have this overall, it wasn't like a, mentality of Jew hatred. That wasn't their main goal. But I don't think they had this, the, their priority was not to save Jewish people or to do anything for the Jews. It was just to win. Whereas the white army, they had like a pretty, like one of their common bonds was that they just didn't like Jews. That was something left over from the Tsarist period. And it was, this has, this whole time was not very far separated from the Tsarist period, like only a couple of years. So, um, I just thought it was kind of ironic to see some of that, and you could still see some of that in modern like literature and stupid memes and whatnot, so just thought it was kind of funny. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at a couple books that talk about the Soviet elite and um, Jewish representation in that elite. I think most of the books pr show pretty clearly that there was an overrepresentation based on the population, um, but like... Again, just like a minority overrepresentation. They were never the majority. And it seemed pretty much like in the 20s and 30s after that time period, it definitely died down. And I would say from the get-go, like after the removal of Trotsky, Kamen Evans, Zinoviev in the mid-20s, it was basically downhill from there. You could argue that in the 1930s, the Soviet secret police, like the Cheka and the NKVD, still had overrepresentation. Uh, but even that eventually died down. Um, a lot of it occurred because of Stalin's russification policies and the Great Purge in the late 30s. But even before that, I think there was always, that was always a diminishing role. Um, but what these books really look at is mainly the Central Committee and the Politburo. Those are the two most important decision-making bodies in the Soviet Union. Um, it was a very top-down type of government, and the Politburo was just the highest organ, I guess you'd say, in the Central Committee. And I want to look at um, those two bodies particularly, because they're very easy to look up the members. You can just look them up on Wikipedia, like each Congress, each central committee, whatever. Um, you can just look up all the members. And the earlier committees didn't have too many people. It was usually like around a couple dozen, I guess. And then eventually they got bigger. 
but I just think it's telling that like a lot of the weird uh, writings or some of the, like the stupid memes you'll find show or say that like oh like there was like hundreds of commissars and like ninety percent of them were Jewish or whatever, but they're just pulling that stuff out of their ass like they don't know what they're talking about. Um, so yeah, the Central Committee is what you want to be looking at in terms of this. And then, I mean, there's other stuff to look at too, like the secret police and stuff, but I'm going to do that in another video, hopefully. So, and so the book, the Soviet elite from Lenin to Gorbachev, um, this book shows that there was, uh, three different categories. I mean, this is an arbitrary categorization, but the book does this. There is three types of revolutionary elite, the core old and new, and that's based upon the ninth, uh, Congress of 1920 so if you were on the central committee after before or both um in regards to that congress and so on average uh jews were about 17 percent, i believe it says of the revolutionary elite um and only half were great russians and jews did happen to be the second largest ethnic group so that's obviously like an overrepresentation. um but again like a minority overrepresentation. It's, it's never, it was never a majority. Um, so there's that. And then it goes on later to basically reaffirm what I was saying earlier that the, um, Russification occurred in the late thirties, which brought down the Jewish, uh, percentage of the revolutionary elite, as well as the Latvian. Um, and there's other, you know, minorities that you could argue were overrepresented like Georgians. Um, if you think about it, Stalin was a Georgian, which is kind of weird that a Georgian led the whole, you know, presumably Russian-Soviet Union. Um, and then the book even says by the death of Stalin, like, less than a percent of the Russian or Soviet elite are Jewish. And it's, like, basically for until the end of the Soviet Union. Um, so that just kind of exemplifies that, yeah, there was an overrepresentation, but it was always a minority. And I would say, like, a declining minority throughout. And then by, I would say by the time of Stalin and especially World War II, I think it's basically like a moot point. And especially by the death of Stalin, it's like not even a, it's not even a controversy anymore. The other book I want to look at is The Rise and Fall of the Soviet Politburo. So this, like obviously, as the name suggests, looks at the Politburo, which is the top decision-making organ of the whole Soviet Union. And the book has a lot of good uh, charts um, just showing like stats and figures, numbers of uh, Central Committee members and Politburo members. Um, I like this chart, table 7.1, I guess not a chart, table, whatever. Uh, just showing all the members, number of members. Um, and you can see like early on, it's not too many members in the Central Committee and even less so in the Politburo. Um, there's members and candidate members. I don't even really know the main difference. I just know candidate members don't have as much uh, authority. So I just thought I would include that in there. In this other table, it shows the nationalities of all the Politburo members at uh, five-year intervals. And so you could see in 1920, 1925, um, the Jewish overrepresentation is pretty clear. Um, that's going to be Trotsky, Kamenev, Zinoviev. Um, but, and yeah, and I guess Kagnovich. And then by 1930, it's just Kagnovich. So he's the only Politburo Jewish Politburo member for the rest of the Soviet Union. Um, and then you can even see Georgians uh, rising in that. And I think that's uh, Stalin and Beria. Um, and then this other table just gives you the, the overall like number and percentages. And uh, interestingly enough, the Georgian and Jewish numbers and percentages are exactly the same. So that just means, I've said previously, there was less Georgians in the Soviet Union than Jews. So that's like just an interesting thing no one ever goes around saying oh georgians are the real masterminds of the soviet union and bolshevism and all that jazz and the book even gives a little blurb about the jewish overrepresentation in the politburo um and just kind of says the same thing i'm saying that it was really only in the uh first half of the 1920s and by the second uh kamenev zinoviev trotsky eliminated also sikolnikov i forgot him um and just with kagnovich remaining and it also mentions the Georgian kind of overrepresentation, you could say. Um, I forgot how to pronounce the other guy's name, but yeah, there's Stalin, Berea, and then later on, like after Stalin, there's other guys. Um, 
So it's just like an interesting uh, factoid, if you will. And the last book I'm going to look at in regards to the just like stats and figures is uh, the Jews of the Soviet Union. And uh, it basically says the same thing, although it has like a little bit of a twist on how it defines Soviet elite. Um, but kind of like the other books were saying, 1918, four of the 14 members of the Central Committee were Jews. 1919, four of the 19. Um, 1921, five of 25. Um, so 10%. 10% on average, of the ruling body, it says, um, but that in the Politburo, the first half of the 1920s, Jews were 23 to 37%, which obviously is overrepresentation. Um, but after that ousting, just Kagnovich. And on page 83, he suggests that there's 417 people total who were ruling the Soviet Union, who were the elite in the mid 1920s. Um, he says the Central Executive Committee which is different than the Central Committee and um, some other bodies. But honestly, I, I just look at the Central Committee and the Politburo of the actual party, not the like Soviet Congress, because the party was the decision-making body. But you could still look at the other organizations because they're still representative of um, you know important figures and stuff. So from that, he says that 6%, 27 of 417 people were Jews. So that's like a lower percentage than if you just look at the Central Committee and Politburo. So again, it's a little arbitrary what you look at. Um, but, you know, I think it's a pretty good, like, measurement overall that wh whatever way you look at it, there's definitely overrepresentation there. But it's always a minority re representation, overrepresentation. And uh, I just think it's good to, like, actually have stats and figures and just look at it plainly. And it's not like books shy away from this or anything. Um, it's just stupid when people like overblow it and make it into this like weird thing which it isn't because every book i've read on the subject will just like straight up say it and they'll even usually have like a little blurb saying like oh like jews were overrepresented overrepresented like other groups and maybe a bit more and they usually just explain this with um like jews being urbanized and being uh literate because at the time literacy was not a given and that the Soviet Union was pretty desperate, especially after the Civil War, to have, like, basically administrators to do things. Um, it's been said that Germans were kind of the administrators during the Tsarist period, even though they were mi a minority, and that Jews kind of replaced that role. So I think that's pretty accurate. Um, but I think it's inaccurate to say that Jews were, like, the leading figures and intellectual figures of the Bolshevik party. I think that they were there to fulfill a function and a role, but I would not say that they were like the top leaders. And I think the evidence of that is that they all got purged and murdered <laughs> eventually. Um, but, and I don't think it's like, because Stalin was a Georgian, I don't think it was a Georgian conspiracy or anything like that. I just think that there was a, the facts are what they are. And that's just how the history played out. It wasn't like this conscious, like Kevin McDonald, like group strategy or anything. It was just how it played out and um, played out pretty poorly for everyone. But I see no reason to like make weird, broad conspiracies over it. And so coming to the end, uh, I do want to real quick analyze Trotsky uh, just because he's touted as kind of like the secondary figure behind Lenin. Um, I do want to say that before the revolution, he was a Menshevik and only joined the party a couple months before the revolution. And obviously during it and during the Civil War, he led the Red Army and kind of put his own ideas to the side out of necessity. But basically right after Lenin's death, he went back to his old Menshevik ways, which were more, I guess you would say, orthodox Marxist. And he wanted uh, his to pursue his idea of permanent revolution as opposed to Stalin's uh, socialism in one country idea. So that's, you know, that among other things is a key reason why he was ousted from the party um, and the whole, like, you know, anti-Trotskyist uh, campaign. Um, but that's just to say that he wasn't like this big influencer in Bolshevik ideology. He wasn't even a Bolshevik for that long. He was a Menshevik for longer. And I want to conclude with a quote from the book, um, The Third Rome. So, and it's quoting 
other figures, but I'll just read it. Uh, Jewish participation in the Russian and the Bolshevik revolutions was very central, but it was not Jews who initiated the revolutionary process and directed it. They were used very extensively and were recruited by many revolutionary organizations, but they served not as masters, but as shopkeepers and salesmen of the Re Russian Revolution, as Pazmanik said. A most interesting observation was made by the German Slavist Walter Ihan, who said that the Russian Revolution found an excellent medium in Jewish internationalism to spread its ideas over the world, so it would seem that all the communist Bolshevik movement proceeds from Jews. According to Bihan, this rule was not only an optical illusion, since the Russian Revolution was an entirely Russian phenomenon. Bihan wrote these lines in 1935 in Nazi Germany, and thus opposed the official Nazi interpretation of the Bolshevik Revolution. So, all that to say, it's more of a complex issue than a lot of these uh, far-right people would have you believe. Um, there's another video about this topic that I'm going to put in the description, which obviously has way more views than mine ever will. Um, but I think that does a pretty good job of like sharing some of the same information, probably in a way better, more entertaining way. And um, yeah, thanks. If you listen this long and watch this long, thank you. And I'm going to try to do some more videos kind of regarding this topic, maybe on the secret police and like other minorities in the Bolshevik uh, party. And then there's going to be a bunch of other Jew-related topics as well. So I'll see you around. Thanks.